to uh, distinguished guests and delegates. Uh, I understand I've got 15 or 20 minutes today, it's, um, so I'm going to go through the presentation uh, at a good pace, and then if there's anything you have questions on, we have a question and answer period afterwards. Very good, very good. Well, thank you again, and um, we'll get started. This presentation today, we're going to be talking about building a country and brand loyalty. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at some, some uh, campaigns that have been done at the national level, at the corporate level, and we're going to take a look at some that have been successful and some that have been not so successful. So what we'll do is we'll just jump right in, and here we go. So first, I think it's helpful to start off with what's a brand? How do we define what a brand is? What do we need to understand when we're talking about a brand? And when I got this definition from the American Marketing Association, what I did was what, what stuck out in my mind here was, you know, we've got the term design symbol or any other feature, but what I really liked was the ISO standards say, they say that a brand's intangible. Okay, I think that's really important to understand. And it's intended to create distinctive images and associations in the minds of stakeholders, not customers, stakeholders. So brands can be many, they can appeal to many different people, thereby generating economic benefits and value. So I think it's important that we understand we, we are able to put branding into a context. Okay, the second thing that I want to talk about today is what customer loyalty. How do we define customer loyalty? And the first thing I want to say is Simon Sinek. Is, has anybody here heard of Simon Sinek? He's, um, he's written a book on that says Start With Why. And Simon Sinek says, look, there's a difference between repeat business and customer loyalty. Okay, so what I think is imp important to understand is that there's a bottom line here. And the way I look at it is that loyal customers are willing to suffer an inconvenience to purchase a good or a service. Can anybody think of a loyal customer? I think of those people that are out, standing out all night long for the new iPhone to be released or something like that. Those are loyal customers. They're going to suffer an inconvenience, okay? All right, so I'm going to dive right in here to some brands. Now, I'm... I live in France, but I'm American, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show brands that are both from the United States and from Europe, okay? So um, this will give you an idea of, of two very big markets for seafood. So we're going to look at retail. Now, Kroger and Wegmans are two retail uh, chains in the United States. Kroger has a number of different banners. It's an enormous company, and Wegmans is a family-owned company. So Kroger, their, two, their 2018 sales were 121.2 billion. So they're a pretty big company. And Wegmans, they were, uh, Forbes estimated that their sales in 2018 were 9.2 billion. Okay, Kroger has come out with their Simple Truth brand. Simple Truth brand. And Wegmans, they've got an organic brand. And if you look here, Simple Truth brand sales exceeded $2.3 billion. That is a brand with traction, okay? Simple Truth, it's natural, organic, it, and it also has free from 101 controversial ingredients. But if you look here on the Wegmans, I just wanted to point something out. It says Wegmans organic, and if you look down below, there's, it's hard to tell, but that's the European uh, symbol for organic. There is no organic, certified organic program in the United States. So what Wegmans has done is, and they're promoting of natural, healthy products, they're using the European organic symbol. Let's look at, uh, at the food service side, the restaurant side, Horica side. We've got Cisco, and then I put Golden Gate Capital. So Cisco, in their 2019 annual report, they were a $60.1 billion company. I'm an ex-Cisco person, so um, when I joined Cisco, I think they were only about 26 billion. So they've grown substantially. And then Golden Gate Capital, they're a private holding company, and here are their brands. Cisco has the Portico Seafood brand, and then you have Golden Gate Capital has Red Lobster. And Red Lobster, for those of you in America, Red Lobster for the seafood lover, and you, everybody knows this song, right? So Red Lobster, they've got sales of about 2.405 billion. Okay, so these are, these are substantial brands, and people recognize them. So 
what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a look at these brands and how do we segment them? How do we enhance these brands? Well, Portico with, with Cisco, they have three different levels. Now, this is it's quality and also cost. Now, their budget line is the Simply line, okay? Then their standard line is the Classic. And then they have Cisco Imperial, which is their, which is their quality line, their, upper, their higher quality line. They also have Cisco Supreme, which is a unique product that's not available anywhere else in the marketplace. Now, in Europe, we have Carrefour, and they've got their quality line. So here you can see what they've done is they're promoting their salmon. It's ASC certified. It's, um, it's certified ASC. It's also, it has not been fed feed that has GMO feed ingredients. So what they've done, it's a, they've, they've shown the picture of the person that works at the farm that's raising the product. And so for them, they have their own private, if you see this here, it means for Carrefour, it's a higher quality line and it's, it's, a, it's got something special. There's also another store in France that sells strictly frozen product, it's called Picard. And here we see some shrimp, okay? And um, these are raised in Madagascar, so they're actually, like the Carrefour, Carrefour's telling you that theirs is raised in Norway. They're coming out saying raised in Madagascar. And then it's also got, a brand enhancement with La Belle Rouge. La Belle Rouge is the quality label in France, and then also it's ASC. So we see here that even though the Picard label, everybody in France recognizes Picard because it's like uh, it, every city has a Picard, and if you're in Paris, it seems like they're on every corner. But this is how they enhance and they segment their brand. So a brand isn't just one label. You can segment and enhance it. This is Tesco. And finally, this is from the UK, and here they got Tesco Finest, okay? And this is to separate it from their regular Tesco brand. And how do they do it? Well, they say their, their Tesco Finest is juicy and plump, warm water prawns, gently cooked to enhance their naturally sweet flavor. Well, the fact of the matter is that it's more expensive than, its own, than their regular brand, and it's strictly based upon size. The ingredients are the same, it's just size. It's actually 25% more expensive based upon the size of the product. So what about country brands? We heard talk about that this morning in the inaugural address. And so by extrapolation, a country brand differentiates products by origin with the intent of creating a competitive advantage. Okay, are there, are there country brands? Absolutely. In the EU, we have what are known as geographically protected areas, okay? So, um, for instance, if you think of Champagne, okay, that, nobody can just use that name, Champagne, or Feta Cheese, or Parma Ham. Uh, these are all things that they have a protected geographical indication. So, Scottish Farm Salmon. Anybody here who's familiar with farm salmon from Scotland? That has the symbol over here. It's a protected geographical indication. One of the problems with Brexit is Scotland says, hey, oh, wait, are we going to lose our protected indication label? And they've, been, they've had the indication since 2004, and they use that when they're promoting their Scottish, their Scottish salmon, and they have their own label for Scottish salmon, no matter what the company is, quality approved Scottish salmon. Okay. I live in France, and French oysters, they are also have the geographic uh, indication. So here, the French oysters not only have that based upon the region, but also they can be La Belle Rouge. So again, when you come to France, when you want to differentiate your brand, you put that La Belle Rouge on there, and everybody, they look at it and go, wow, it's going to taste better. It, it naturally is better. It's a French program for quality. And then also, if they say it's from this area and it has that symbol on it, you know it's genuine, it's authentic. It's kind of like traceability, okay? Well, let's take a look at some other brands that are out there, whether or not regional or national. Well, when I got my start in the business, I, I fished commercially up in Alaska. And Alaska, to give you an idea, the fisheries in Alaska, this is straight from the ASME website, the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, they produced $13.9 billion in economic output and $5.2 billion went to the Alaska economy each year. They produced 
5.7 billion pounds of seafood in the 2017-2018 season, and they directly employ 60,000 people. So this is a significant fishing area, fishing region. Now, they have, the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, they have this, this logo. So it's wild, it's natural, and it's sustainable. I help the, the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute when we talk about sustainability, I help them to um, develop their, their program for sustainability. But let's take a look at one of the products. How does ASME go out and promote their seafood from Alaska? Well, they've got lots of materials and they update these materials all the time. So here's what they had for Alaska King Crab, the latest thing they had on their website. These are available to people whether or not you're in retail, by the way, if I'm speaking too quickly, let me know. <laughs> and food service. So, they have king crab, they've got a nice brochure, they have recipes. <coughs> if you have a seafood display, you can put the king crab um, uh, label there. And then they also have wild Alaska seafood product of the USA. So here they are, they're promoting their brand, their Alaskan seafood, and they've got products, and, and thank you, um, they've got products behind, uh, we'll see if I go the right direction here, products to support the, uh, so I, I mentioned earlier about the, their, their sustainability program, they have the Alaska RFM program, so in, additional, in addition to having the Alaska seafood marketing brand, they now have a logo that they use to differentiate Alaskan seafood products that are approved in their uh, RFM program. So let's take a look. What goes, how, how was it received out there in the marketplace? 80% of consumers surveyed say that seeing the Alaska seafood logo would increase their likelihood to purchase. I say that's pretty successful. Okay. Well, let's take a look at another program. Let's look at the Norwegian Seafood Council. They've got offices. We heard earlier this morning in the inaugural address, people that need to have offices in other countries. Norway, they've got offices in Brazil, China. You can see the list here. They've got three priorities. The first priority is marketing and market research. Very, very important. They spend a lot of time on market research. And then communication and risk management. So let's say there's a problem with Norwegian salmon. They do all the messaging and they are the ones that are the, in the line of fire if there's a problem with chemicals or antibiotics or any of these things. That's what the Norwegian Seafood Council is there for. They help the producers develop their messaging to communicate when these problem situations arise. Well, it's interesting. They're funded by an annual registration fee as well as export and research fees. And here's something that I think is important. They spend their money where they see it's needed. In 2016, they spent $27.8 million promoting Norwegian salmon in the marketplace. Most of that was in France, where I am, in Germany, and uh, they were doing that because they were having some issues, but they're not afraid to spend money to promote the products. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I wanna show you, um, I want to show you there we go. Um, a little film about the Norwegian Seafood Council, how they differentiate themselves. Thanks to the cold that gave us glaciers. Thanks to the glaciers that gave us fjords. Thanks to the nature that gave us perfect conditions. Thanks to the people that gave us ideas. Thanks to the science that gave us aquaculture. Thanks to the aquaculture that gave us salmon. to the trade that gave us the possibility to serve 14 million meals of Norwegian salmon every day around the globe.
you can see the Norwegians are very active in what they're doing. Okay, very good. If I can just get back to my presentation. <clears throat> so the Norwegians are very, very active in promoting their products. So are they successful? Well, 2019 was a record year for them. I'd say they're extremely successful in their promotion of products. Okay, so we have five more minutes. We're going to go quickly. Um, and also there's a premium that's paid for Norwegian products if you run the numbers here. Um, another, another national marketing program, it's easier to use this actually, um, is Pangasius Your Everyday Fish. It was um, established by the Vietnamese um, VASAP Association, uh, that represents exporters and producers. And this was to counter negative campaigns for Pangasius in Europe, launched in 2014. You can see the websites in various languages, but not in Chinese. Here are the sales. This is why they had to develop it. Sales went down. And even after 2014, they continued to go down. And we see that they came up a little bit in 2018. Well, in 2019, we know that Germany increased 32.5%. But when you look here and you follow Germany down, you can see that it's still not even back where it was. So. Let's take a look at 2019. All right, through the 11 months in 2019, total export value was down 11%. U.S. imports down 47%. EU imports down 1.1%, and China imports increased 47%. They're treading water. And so I don't know if we can say that it's successful because the website's not even in Chinese. What about salmon from Chile? Well, in 2016, Sarna Pesca, they established an, an antibiotic-free uh, program and they started certifying farms. By summer of 2019, 110 farms had been certified. Well, then we had a hiccup, we had a problem because a company called Nova Austral, they had, um, that were the first company to be awarded the certificates, they had problems. How did they, how did they get their antibiotic free? Well, what they did was they stocked more fish in, the, in their sites and the fish died and they weren't declaring their mortalities. So there, there was this promise of Patagonia. They had the promise of Patagonia, which was launched in, uh, in Boston, where they talked about reducing antibiotics. And um, we've got some people from Monterey Bay program here. They're part of the Chilean salmon antibiotic reduction program. And even though Nova Ostral, the, the problem wasn't with antibiotics, it was with reporting on mortalities, um, they wound up having their certification suspended. Not just with Sarna Pesca, but with the ASC, which caused a lot of problems for them. So be very careful with programs, how you promote yourself, because you want to make sure that everybody is aware of the consequences. So there was a lot of negative press that surrounded this. Okay, shrimp, we'll, we'll wrap it up here with the last one. We've got shrimp from uh, Ecuador. We have the Sustainable Shrimp Partnership. There's four requirements, you can see them there. One of them is ASC, another one is antibiotic free. And they wanted to get 20% of their producers in Ecuador to qualify in the first year. So there they are, they've got their brand. Here you can see ASC certified, it's the blue box. It's the Sustainable Shrimp Partnership shrimp. And you can see Ecuador here, even before they got their brand, their sales were growing. They were, they were growing their trade. And even if you take a look at 2019, where they were here, um, I've, I've got the spreadsheet from, uh, from their national uh, association, 633,892 metric tons. And even though it's just quarters, you can see that's up significantly from the uh, 2018. Um, but uh, what happened? We know that with Ecuador, uh, they, they had problems in China, and their shrimp was banned in China. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I was asked specifically to talk a bit about the U.S. marking initiative that the Global Aquaculture Alliance is involved in. It was launched in Ecuador in 2018. They've had six meetings since then, and there are industry members, both from the United States, from India, uh, from all around the world that are involved in, in trying to get a program established for marketing shrimp. Um, there are three basic funding models. One would work through the United States government, 
where uh, the importers have to pay a tax. Another would be something like we saw at ASME or the Norwegian Seafood Council, where India would establish its own program. And the final one would be uh, voluntary, where people just put their money in. It's estimated that this program would cost $15 million a year for a minimum, they need a minimum of three to five years to get this program up and running. So conclusions. It's important to identify why you want and need a brand. Ecuador already had a brand. They were already increasing their sales. So you have to wonder, um, they put a lot more money into it, but they already had their own brand identity. Um, the next is, my other conclusion is money and government support really helps. So you can see here, ASME is funded by federal support and an industry levy, and so is the Norwegian Seafood Council. And they had a budget in, in Norway in 2018 of, uh, of 50, uh, 50 50.25 million. So the other thing is you need to understand who you want to appeal to. It's much easier to, for, with the consumers, you've got over 7 billion consumers. But if you're working here, B2B, it's much easier to use the WWF theory of change model and you can convince the people that are in the, that are in the B2B model to do the promotion. Remember we saw the private brand label with Kroger, a $121 billion company. Kroger's gonna go out and promote your product once, they, once you've convinced Kroger to buy. And then the other thing is know how your audience choice edits. Choice editing means what are they requiring? Is it ASC? Is it BAP? Is it what do they need to have from you to be certain that your product is credible and safe for the consumer? And then finally, it's all about commitment and follow through. And here, I, I like to go saying that you can't cross the sea merely by standing and staring at the water. So with that, I'll say thank you.